Well, good morning. It is, it is a joy to be with you all. Like my brother said, the last time I preached in this pulpit, I was not feeling very good. And, uh, and I had to take a step back from ministry and get some treatment and figure that out. And it was a journey of about four years. And by God's grace, I got treated and I'm feeling really basically 100%. And that's really all a testimony to God's grace. Um, not many people who go through what I went through uh, make it to this point. And um, it's not because I'm worthy of it or I did something well or prayed enough prayers or anything like that. Of course, we know that. It's just God's kindness. And um, so I'm just very thrilled um, to be here this morning and very honored and privileged to be able to bring God's word to you this morning. I'd like to give a shout out to um, three fathers in the room today, which would be my brother who was just up here, Jay Street. This is the first time he is a father with a newborn who's actually out of the womb. And uh, we are very th- uh, thrilled to just see him just flourishing as a father. He's doing a great job. Uh, I believe his father-in-law, Barry Peratt, is here. Is Barry here? I don't, I don't even know where you guys are. Like, oh, there you guys are. You're way over there. Yeah, there you go. So he's here. He's just a, a, just a gracious, loving man who loves the Lord, and is just a, a faithful father as well. So it's a joy to see you today. And, um, of course, last but not least, my own father. Um, what, a, what a joy to have John Street as my father. He is such an example and a picture of my heavenly father in ways that I just cannot even express. So um, so happy Father's Day to you all and the rest of you in this room. Happy Father's Day for those of you who are fathers. Um, Thank you for the faithfulness in your homes and continue spurring on for the sake of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've got a Bible with you, please open it to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. This is my favorite passage Uh, in all of scripture. And it is ministered to my heart in some very hard moments of life. And I trust that it will minister to your heart as well. I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Version. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. I shall seek earnestly for you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land without water. Thus I have beheld you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will laud you. Thus I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with fatness and richness, and my mouth offers praises with lips of joyful songs. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a portion for foxes. But the king will be glad in God. Everyone who swears by him will boast, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be closed. Our Father, we come before you in desperate need of your grace at this particular point. Help us, O God, to pay attention to your word to glean from it what you would have us to learn. And I pray, Father, that you would speak through me words that would be most beneficial to these dear saints here as they continue to struggle through the different aspects of their lives, wrestle with sin, wrestle with the world, wrestle with the devil, wrestle with so many different challenges and circumstances. Father, may this be a psalm of refreshment and encouragement to their hearts or perhaps even of conviction to be able to spur them on to seek you all the more. We pray this in the name of your Son, who gives us all the grace to do this. Amen. Once in a while, I like to bake. I love baking. I'm not good at it, but I like it. 
Uh, chocolate chip cookies is, is my favorite, I think. I love making chocolate chip cookies. and my, my mom has a killer recipe. And one of the secrets to this recipe is a special vanilla that we use and we add to the mixture. And this vanilla is so potent that you really only need to add a few drops to really make the cookies come out so tasty. Just a few drops makes a big difference. A big difference. Sometimes all it takes is one word to make a big difference. Just one word. And there's one word in this psalm that does exactly that. Did you catch it? Do you know what it is? It's actually not in the psalm itself. The word is actually in the heading of the psalm. The word I'm referring to is wilderness. Wilderness. The word, although trapped in the fine print at the top of your psalm, and so easy to gloss over uh, or maybe even rush past, is actually the most important word of this psalm. All of Psalm 63 hangs on just this one word. Its message is shaped by it. Its theology is guided by it. Its application is completely influenced by it. What is so special about this word wilderness? To us, the wilderness just sounds like a hot, dry, and uncomfortable climate, right? And we're used to that around here in Bakersfield, are we not? I think this is safe to say this is a hot and dry climate. But in the Bible, the wilderness is so much more than an inconvenient climate. The wilderness was actually a place people in your Bible found themselves quite regularly. And as such, the wilderness carries with it a lot of history, It brings to mind a lot of memories. Places tend to do that for us. For those of you who are are married, if you were to visit the place where you had your first date, for example, or maybe where you got engaged, there's a rush of memories and emotions that probably flood your mind, right? It's no different with the wilderness in Scripture. The wilderness is a common pit stop for so many people in the Bible. And what you find in all these situations is that the wilderness has developed a reputation. It gives off a certain impression. What kind of place is the wilderness known for in the Bible? The wilderness is always remembered as a place of testing. It's a place of testing. Take, for example, what God says to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, when they approach the end of their 40 years in the wilderness. God says, And you shall remember all the way which Yahweh your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Or listen to what Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says about Jesus regarding his time in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Those are the kind of memories that the word wilderness evokes when you read wilderness here at the beginning of Psalm 63. The wilderness is a place of testing. It's a place of testing. In the wilderness, people are put under the microscope. In the wilderness, people are pushed to their limits. In the wilderness, you find out who people really are. What's in the heart comes to the surface, and what really matters to someone is revealed. That's what the wilderness does. That's what it's meant to do. This is why people even describe dark moments in their lives as what? A wilderness experience, right? Whether they know it or not, the analogy they're using actually comes directly from the Bible. The wilderness is a time of trial and difficulty. And so when you're struggling in your life in one form or another, it's not inaccurate for you to say, I'm in the wilderness right now. That's actually a biblical statement. Maybe you're in the wilderness right now. Maybe you've come to church this morning and your head is spinning You don't know what to do. You don't know how to make sense of it. It's a difficulty that is insurmountable, and you are just overwhelmed. You're trying to make sense of all this. And if you're in that spot this morning, I want you to know two things. One, God cares for you. We know that. 
And two, God cares for you by bringing you into this wilderness. That's right. This isn't by accident. This isn't unplanned. God is sovereign over your wilderness, and he has a purpose in it. If Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested, do you really think that you're going through your wilderness without cause? God puts people in the wilderness because he loves them. He has a purpose in it. There's an important lesson he wants you to learn. It's in these wilderness moments where God makes you see how vulnerable you really are, how desperate you really are, how needy you really are. The the, the wilderness brings you to your breaking point. The wilderness puts you in a place where you have nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. You're stuck gasping for air. And it's in that helpless moment you learn real fast what matters in this world. You find out what your greatest need really is. You discover that all the things you once held dear in this life mean absolutely nothing. All the relationships you once pursued, all the comforts you once relied on, all the pleasures you once craved, they don't mean squat. You finally see that there's only one thing you really need. You need God. You need God. Just him. That's why God has put you in this wilderness. As dark as it may look, as miserable as it may feel, as hopeless as it may seem, God is hedging your way to lead you to himself. He wants you to feel with every part of your being that he has been and he is and he always will be the only one you need. And guess what? That's what Psalm 63 is all about. That's what it's all about. When your back is against the wall and you don't know where to turn, Psalm 63 is for you. It's for you. And its message to you is quite simply this. God is all you need. God is all you need. And that's not just some cheap platitude. We're talking about a wilderness here. This is real. This is when stuff in life gets real. God is all you need. And the way Psalm 63 is going to show us this is by giving us three reasons God is all you need. Now, you should know the way this is going to work is a little different than a typical three-point outline. Uh, These reasons are built on top of each other, much like layers of a rock over top of a gold mine, okay? So with each layer that we dig up, we find bigger and more precious gems until we finally strike gold at the bottom. So the more we get into this psalm, you'll find this, the closer we get to the heart of why we need God, okay? Does that make sense? That's how we're going to go. That's how we're approaching this because I believe that's how Psalm 63 is organized. So let's dig into our first layer this morning. The first reason God is all you need is this if you're taking notes, God is all satisfying. This is the first reason. God is all satisfying. And David shows us this in verses 1 through 5 of our, of our psalm here. God is all satisfying. And if God is all satisfying, then the logic is he's all you really need, okay? That's, that's it. How do these five verses communicate this truth to us? Well, verses one through five walk us through three stages of what someone satisfied by God looks like. And these stages are really pretty straightforward. We have what it looks like before satisfaction in verses one and two. We have what it looks like once you reach satisfaction in verse three. And then we have what it looks like after satisfaction in verses 4 and 5. Okay, so before, during, after satisfaction. Okay, that's how these verses are broken down. So stage one, before satisfaction. This is what you can expect someone to look like before he's satisfied by God. What does that look like? Let's read in verse 1. O God, you are my God. I shall seek earnestly for Uh, I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land without water. 
Uh, this church, I know our pastor here preaches from an LSB, but some of you guys might have an ESV in your lap, and that's fine. That's a good translation. But you should know that the ESV says something a little bit different. It says, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. But you should know there is no as in the text there. Okay, In the original Hebrew text, there is no as. The LSB has got it better where it just says it's in a dry and weary land, okay? And that's very important. What is the key word of this psalm we, t- we just mentioned? Wilderness, right? Wilderness. Uh, David's actually in the wilderness. We don't have to make a comparison here, okay? David is literally in the wilderness. This isn't theoretical for him. It's actually hot. It's actually dry, just like it is today, right? There's a fire going on over the grapevine. That's real, right? This is real for him. He's actually in the wilderness. He should be thirsty for water, but it's interesting because that's not what he says he's thirsty for. He's thirsty for what? God. God. His soul thirsts for God. His flesh yearns for God, not as in, but in the middle of a dry and weary land where there is no water. David's scouring every square inch of the wilderness, turning over every rock and looking in every hole to find, guess what? Not water, as you would think, but God. The punchline is so surprising, right? But it's not without purpose. Think about this. To thirst for God as though you are in a dry and weary land is to put thirsting for God on par with thirsting for water, okay? And that's good. But here's what David's saying. To thirst for God when you're actually in a dry and weary land is to put your thirst for God above your thirst for water. Does that make sense? This is, he's pushing the limits here. That's what David's communicating. This is what it looks like for someone who's ready to be satisfied by God. You come to the place not of wanting God as much as you would want some of the most basic necessities of life when you need them the most, but you want God more than the most basic necessities of life even when you're in need of them the most. That's what's going on. That's what the wilderness does for you. It brings you to this point. It's meant to wean you off the appetites of this world and to stimulate a craving in your soul for the only one who can truly satisfy. Money no longer satisfies. Fleshly pleasures no longer satisfy. Security and protection no longer satisfy. Just him. The wilderness is where every worldly affection goes to die. The wilderness is where God becomes your one and only oasis. But David's not done with stage one yet. There's more in verse two. Look at verse two here. He also says, Thus I have beheld you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. In verse 2, David transports us back in time to a moment in his life when he was back home in Jerusalem, out of the wilderness, out of the uncomfortable, hot, dry climate, and in perhaps the comforts of his palace or something like that. And he reflects back to a time when he used to go and visit God's sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary is just another word for the tabernacle. Long before David was in the wilderness, he used to visit the tabernacle Uh, with this same thirst for God. He used to make trips to the tabernacle to see God and be satisfied by him in some way. And in what way was David hoping God would satisfy his thirst? Well, the verse says here that he was specifically looking to see God's power and his glory. His power and his glory. It probably makes sense to most of us that the tabernacle was a place where you could see God's glory. I mean, after all, God's glory would come down and fill the tabernacle when it was first built by Israel in the wilderness. We know that. But David didn't just go to the tabernacle to see God's glory. He also went to see God's power, his power. What does he mean by that? You know, what is he talking about? 
I mean, I don't know about you, but when I think about the tabernacle, power isn't the first my, a word that comes to mind, right? Maybe ornate because of all the golden utensils everywhere. Perhaps gory because of all the slaughter of sheep and bulls. Not power. What's powerful about an oversized tent? What's that going to do? And this is where a careful study of the tabernacle, what it stands for and all that it means is very helpful. You see, the tabernacle was not just a physically beautiful structure. Every station and instrument had meaning and purpose assigned to it. To help you understand this, let me share it with you uh, by way of illustration. Uh, 16 years ago, I I got to visit uh, one of the most famous archaeological museums in the world called the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And in that museum, I had the opportunity to see a lot of neat artifacts. There were a lot of large clay pots and tablets and statues and things of that nature, right? That's what you see in those kinds of archaeological museums. It's pretty cool, but all it's meant to be is a relaxing stroll through a giant building to satisfy your intellectual curiosity, okay? However, several weeks before I went to that Egyptian museum, I also visited another museum, only this wasn't an archaeological museum. This was a Holocaust museum in Israel, Now, the Holocaust Museum, by its very nature, is meant to serve a very different purpose than the one in Egypt. Its purpose is not so much to show off cool relics. Instead, it's meant to tell a powerful story. Picture after picture, video after video, display after display, all carefully organized in one place to share a serious message about the evils of the Holocaust. The tabernacle is not like the Egyptian museum where you can go see cool antiques. You know, oh, they've got an altar you can go look at? That's neat, right? You know, oh, they've got a special Holy Holies exhibit? Let's go! Well, if you go, you're not going to come back, so that's not going to work very well. No, 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 this is more like a Holocaust museum. It's meant to tell a powerful story. As you walk into the tabernacle, you'd hear the bleeding of sheep and rams. You'd see the slitting of animals' throats. You'd hear the washing of hands and utensils. You'd smell the aroma of animals burned on altars. What was the point of all that? It was meant to tell you a powerful story. It's intended to send a glorious message. David went into the tabernacle to stare at God so he could learn more about this powerful story, so he could visualize what this glorious message was. But what story is being told that's so powerful? What message is being sent that's so glorious? Well, that leads us to stage two now, satisfaction. We've now moved from stage one before satisfaction to stage two, satisfaction. We see this in verse three. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will laud you. What powerful story is being told in the tabernacle? What glorious message is being sent? The verse says it's because your loving kindness, O God, is better than life itself. That's the story. And then that's why David says, my lips will laud you, God, and not anyone else, by implication. So this is the powerful story. This is the glorious message. And somehow, some way, this is what makes God all satisfying to David, okay? So the question you should be asking yourself is what? What does that mean? What does it mean that God's loving kindness is better than life? Well, I hate to disappoint you, but David doesn't really tell us right here. He just kind of leaves you in the dark. (laughs) But don't worry, he's not going to leave you in the dark indefinitely. He'll answer this question, but only by the end of the psalm. So he doesn't show his cards right away, but he will soon. And so that's actually uh, the uh, approach I'm going to take with you this morning. I'm going to make you wait until the end of the sermon to answer the question for you, okay? And in so doing, I think you'll appreciate it all the more. A theater audience enjoys a movie so much more if important revelations are saved for the end, right? We know that. 
And in the same way, you will find the answer to our question so much sweeter after taking this journey with me through the entirety of this psalm. But for now, just know, God is all satisfying because his loving kindness is better than life, okay? We got that? All right. Third and final stage, after satisfaction, after satisfaction. So we saw what it looks like before satisfaction. We caught a glimpse of what it looks like when satisfaction is reached. But now we get to see what it looks like after satisfaction. Once satisfaction is reached, what are the results? What, what does it look like in the believer's life? The next two verses here give us four characteristics, okay? You ready for these? Four characteristics. We'll move these, through these real quick. The psalm in verse uh, 4 begins and says, Thus I will bless you as long as I live. The first characteristic there is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Um, To bless God is always what you do in response to God blessing you first. So that's thanksgiving. Satisfaction in God always leads to giving thanks to God. Second characteristic is dependence. Verse 4 again says, I will lift up my hands in your name. So maybe just like a frightened child lifts up his hands to mommy to pick him up when someone, something scares him. So someone who is satisfied by God recognizes his absolute need for God in any and every situation, whether it be fearful or just there's a need or whatever the situation may be. So he lifts up his hands there. So satisfaction in God always leads to complete dependence on God. Third characteristic, contentment, contentment. Verse 5 says, my soul is satisfied as with fatness and richness. Now, what does that mean? Uh, Fatness and richness are words that describe the fatty portions of an animal that were cooked on the altar, and then they were discarded after a Levitical sacrifice, okay? That's what you, you should know that. These were considered the best parts of the animal, the best parts. And uh, they were not something that the, the people got to eat because they were reserved for God himself. That's why they were burned on the altar and basically incinerated, and then the ashes were scooped off, okay? Does that make sense? So that's what's going on there. But what does David say here in the psalm? He says, what? My soul will be satisfied as with fatness and richness. In other words, God isn't the only one who gets to enjoy the best parts. We do too, What are the best parts for us that we get to enjoy? God himself. God himself. So satisfaction in God always leads to perfect contentment in God. He's the best. He's the best. Last characteristic is joy. Joy. Uh, Verse 5 again says, And my mouth offers praises with lips of joyful songs. Uh, Not much more needs to be said here. Singing has always been one of the clearest indications someone is joyful, right? Right? Satisfaction in God always leads to excessive joy in God. So this is what it looks like for God to be all-satisfying. It starts with an insatiable hunger for God. It reaches a place of feasting on God, and it finishes with a full belly satisfied in God. When you choose to locate all your satisfaction in God, you will take that first step to understand this one important truth. God is all you need. The wilderness you are in right now is designed by God to expose where your satisfaction really lies. When people's backs are against the wall, you will find them scouring their wilderness, turning over every rock and looking in every hole to find the one thing that satisfies them the most. Moths are attracted to flames, roaches to the dark. What are you drawn to? I'm not calling you a roach, okay, but what are you drawn to? What's your security blanket? What do you find yourself running to? Some run to financial stability. Others to people's approval and affirmation. Still others fly to different relationships or carnal pleasures or entertainment, perhaps. I've got news for you. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. So says Jesus in John chapter 4. Those wells dry up real fast. But whoever drinks of the water that Jesus will give him will never thirst, ever. 
but the water that he will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And if God leaves you in the wilderness long enough and if his grace permits, your wilderness will teach you that you don't need all this stuff to be satisfied uh, in your dry and weary land. You just need who? You just need God. Why? Because he is truly all satisfying. That was the first reason. Let's dig down a little further. The second reason God is all you need, God is all supporting. God is all supporting. This is what we find in verses six through eight. It says there, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So David, convinced now that he can be satisfied by God, turns his attention to dwelling on God. He's digging deeper into why God is really so satisfying. And the answer is fairly straightforward. It's because he's all-supporting. He's all-supporting. Or you could say maybe he's all-strengthening. Anytime David needs support, he has it. Any moment he needs help, he's got it. David understands that God is his support. And if God is his support, there is nothing David lacks. Because when God supports you, you don't need anything else. Period. He does it all. That's what we see from God's perspective. But, but what about from our perspective? What is the expected response of someone who's completely supported like this? Dependence, right? Dependence. Complete dependence. When you come to the place where you can say, God is my, all my support, I don't need anything else, then you naturally rest confidently in the Lord, right? Right? Oh, but this takes work. This takes so much work. It's not easy. It is easier said than done. It's not natural for the human soul to rest in the arms of someone else, especially when that someone is invisible, mysterious, and sometimes does things you don't always understand or even like, right? How do we get to a place where we learn to fully depend on God? David shows us how in these three verses in Psalm 63. He tells you how you can come to depend on God. And that's verse 6 there, how you depend on God. And then he tells you why you come to depend on God. That's verses 7 and 8, okay? So how you depend on God, why you depend on God. So first, how? How do you come to depend on God? Well, verse 6 said, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. How do you come to depend on God? How did David do it? Well, you can summarize the answer found in this verse in just one word. Meditation. Meditation. That's what verse 6 shows us. Now, Far from the mystical connotations this word has today, you should know meditation is not emptying your mind, okay? Don't believe that. That is a lie from the world, okay? That's not true. Meditation, as it's defined in the Bible, is actually the exact opposite. It's filling your mind with biblical truth and then rehearsing that truth over and over and over again until it becomes ingrained in your soul, until it becomes like clockwork. That's meditation. That's meditation. Athletes are good at their sport, not just because they are physically fit. I know we think that, like, oh, you're just such, you're so physically fit, you could do anything. It's not true. A boxer can't hit a baseball. Um, A swimmer can't shoot a three unless they've also trained in those sports, right? They're good at their sport. Why? Not just because they're physically fit, that's true, but because they have trained in that sport for years. They have conditioned their bodies so well and built up so much muscle memory that it becomes like second nature for them to do what they do. We marvel at it. Oh, how do you do that? 
You know what they'll tell you? I woke up at 4 a.m. every morning to go to the gym, to work out, and then to practice and practice and practice over and over again. Yep, it just takes hard work. The believer, in the same way, comes to depend on God, not by accident, but by meticulous, tireless, and relentless meditation on God's word. So dependence, it's not by accident. It must be cultivated with intentional and incessant effort. And that's exactly what we see here with David. So first, let me break that down for you. His meditation, first of all, is intentional. It's intentional. Look what he says there. He says, when I remember you on my bed. Uh, Don't think of remember like, oh, I forgot my water bottle at the office today. Um, That's me, by the way. I forget my water bottle everywhere. I'm probably going to forget my water bottle by the time we leave the, the, the church premise today. Um, that's, that's just what I do. Um, remembering in, in Scripture is not recalling something that you forgot. Remembering, as defined in the Bible, is fixing your mind on something, fixing your gaze on something. When David remembers God, it's not like he forgot that God existed, okay? That's not what he's saying. He is proactively pushing all other thoughts out of his mind and replacing them with just God. That's what it means to remember. And he does this while he's laying on his bed at night. When you're in the wilderness, literally or figuratively, sleeplessness is common. And so it's no surprise we don't find David sleeping at night here. Um, Now, there are some of us who can't sleep because we are always tempted to fix our problems ourselves in our own strength, right? Where we're scheming, we're racking our brains, trying to figure out how we're going to resolve this issue. But notice, that's not what David's doing. Did you catch what he's doing there? He's not doing that. Oh, he's sleepless, all right. It's true. But he's not thinking about all the ways he's going to solve his problem. He's not worrying. He's not planning. He's not strategizing. What's he doing? He's thinking, he's meditating on God. In other words, he's not sleepless because he's fearful. He's sleepless because he's, he just can't take his mind off God. He just can't get enough of God. He's intentionally pushed all those pesky thoughts of fear, anxiety, panic out of his mind just to focus on who? God. We would do well to learn to do that ourselves, wouldn't we? And he does this because he knows he depends entirely on him. That's what it looks like for God to be all-supporting for you. It comes by way of intentional meditation. But it's not just intentional meditation. It's also incessant it's incessant. It says, it says there that I will meditate on you in the night watches. Night watches. Uh, back in David's time, nighttime referred to the uh, 12-hour half of the evening side of a day, of a 24-hour day. So, you know, daytime was considered 12 hours of the day. Nighttime was considered 12 hours of the day. So in this second half, 12-hour chunk, there were what, what, what was known as uh, three night watches that would take place, okay? And each, what, each night watch then would make up four-hour blocks, right? So four plus four plus four equals tw- 12. You guys know math? Okay. Uh, <laughs> didn't think you were going to be doing math this morning, did you? Yeah. So I'm just trying to help you understand how it works there. But um, there were three night watches, four hours each, okay? Now think about this. David is meditating on God not for a night watch, but for night watches. At least two of those blocks, likely three. He's using all the night hours. He's not sleeping to think about who? God. And he's not sleeping a lot. Why? Why would you do that, David? Wouldn't it be better to use your time uh, to, to sleep? You're in danger. You need your strength. No. No. Of course not. This, this tells you how much David depends on who? 
God, not on sleep. It came by way, not just of intentional meditation, but incessant meditation. He doesn't stop. There are some of us who can't sleep because we are always tempted to fix our problems ourselves, but then there are others of us who can sleep and sleep too much because we are trying to sleep our problems away, to put our heads in the sand and distract ourselves until things get better. Not David. Not David. He uses every hour, every minute of the night to meditate on who? God. Why? Because he knows he depends on him. Every second David's awake, he's leveraging it for dependent meditation. That's what it looks like for God to be all-supporting for you. It comes by way of incessant meditation. So intentional meditation, incessant meditation, that's, that's how. That's how you depend on God. But why do you depend on God? Why do you depend on God? What is it about him that makes him all-supporting and so dependable? In other words, what is David even meditating on to begin with? What's on his mind? That's what we learn in verses 7 and 8. Look there, it says, For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Verse 7 starts out, For you have been my help. That's what David's meditating on. That's what he's meditating on. Notice he's not rehearsing abstract ideas about God. Oh God, you're just so loving. You're just so, you know, this and that and everything. That's great. That's nothing wrong with that. He's being very specific though. There's something very concrete here. He's recalling every moment of his past when God came to his aid. That's very specific. He's remembering when God delivered him, perhaps, from from giant Goliath. He's, He's reflecting on when God rescued him from homicidal Saul. He's recalling when God saved him from defiant Ishbosheth. Like, I don't even know that guy existed in the Bible. Yeah, he did. And on and on and on we could go. He's recalling all this because God was there with him every single step of the way. What David is rehearsing in his mind over and over and over again on his bed are real life instances where God spared his life and helped him out. That could be why it's actually taking all night. There's like so much to think about. And so David concludes verse 7 and says, in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. I sing for joy. The help that God has provided him in the past becomes a catalyst for his joy. The very thought of resting in the shadow of God's wings brings David to a place where he cannot contain his excitement. But what's the point of all this? Why reflect on the past so much? Why spend all his thoughts there? We think certainly the present would be more compelling, right? The situation is dire. At least spend your hours, David, calling out to God for help. And to be sure, there are many psalms that model that approach for us. But here David chooses to spend his time meditating on the past exclusively. And the reason why is found in verse 8. Check this out. This is probably my favorite verse in the entire psalm. My soul is clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Why invest all your time and energy meditating on the past? Because the God who was so faithful time and time again in the past will be just as faithful in the what? In the present. That's why. The past always serves as a concrete witness to God's faithfulness so that you will learn to trust him in whatever present crisis you're facing. Have you ever wondered why so much of your Bible is a bunch of stories? Why not like a theology textbook? Why not just lay it out very clearly what you want us to learn, God? Just, you know, just didactically, just teach it to us, you know, point by point by point. Why not 66 epistles, right? That's not the way God designed it. Much of your Bible is story. And the reason why is very simple. Because God knows we need to see his power at work in the past 
to trust his power at work in the present. History is what actualizes theology. History is what grounds it in reality. So David concludes, my soul clings to you. Why? Because your right hand is the only one that supports me. Now, you got the force of this, you have to understand, is one of desperation. The Hebrew is very clear here. It's like David is wrapping his arms around God's ankles as if God is going to walk out on him. That's kind of the idea. Not that David thinks it's going to happen, but the idea here is this is a man who realizes that if God were to walk out on him, it's over. He's done. All the help in the past doesn't matter anymore. God all along has been faithful to him to bring him through every single wilderness. And so David knows there's no way he's going to make it out without him. There's no way he's going to survive without God actually supporting him. That's why you come to depend on God. You realize when you survey the storms of your life and compare it with God's faithful track record, you don't stand a chance without him there. Think back on your life. Remember how God has brought you to this point. Remember how God saved you out of your sinfulness and how he rescued you from all of your darkness and how he has brought you through every trial, every difficulty, every single challenge. And he has been faithful every step of the way. Don't forget that in the middle of your wilderness. Don't forget that. When you're in that wilderness and when your world is collapsing in and your reality is unraveling, this is where God is taking you. This is where you need to be. When you receive that terminal diagnosis, when you lose your job, when finances are tight, when your child walks away from the faith, you you not only learn real quick that everything you used to trust in cannot help you, you are forced to remember that there is one who has carried you this whole way and he will keep carrying you. He will. Is that not what God has promised you? It's not just for David. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all, all, all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, strengthen, confirm, and ground you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. That's a promise to you. Not to David. That wasn't made to David. David's long gone now. That's to you. God is all supporting. That was the second reason. Let's dig down one more level. Third and final reason, God is all you need. God is all saving. God is all saving. Read with me verses 9 through 11. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a portion for foxes. But the king will be glad in God. Everyone who swears by him will boast, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be closed. These are the three most important verses of this psalm. It may not seem like it, because it's like, where did did these verses even come from? Almost almost out of nowhere. But everything has been building to this point. This is the climax. This is the peak. This is the crown of the psalm. We've been drilling deeper and deeper into the issue of why God is all we need, and we've struck gold here. God is not just all-satisfying. He's not just all-supporting. God is all-saving. But to understand what David means by this, we have our work cut out for us because these are not the only the most important verses to understand in this psalm. They are also the most difficult verses to understand in this psalm. Um, why does David all of a sudden transition to talking about enemies? They didn't exist up until this point. Who are they? What is the point here? These questions and many more are important for us to answer if we're going to understand the most important part of this psalm. So let's start unpacking these 
three verses, and I hope you're still awake at this point, okay? Um, But we're going to keep unpacking these, and I think you'll begin to see what's going on here. First of all, who are these enemies that David's talking about? Well, the text here in the psalm, it doesn't give us much to go on. But we do know one thing for sure. Whoever these enemies are, they are chasing David, remember key word, in the wilderness, right? They're chasing David in the wilderness. And that right there is enough for us to conclude that these enemies are probably either forces sent by Saul earlier in David's life um, when he was um, wandering in the wilderness there, or they are forces sent by David's son Absalom later on in David's life when he wandered in the wilderness for just a brief moment. It's got to be either one of those two moments, right? So which one is it, you ask? Is it like Saul or is it Absalom? Um, That's a good question. No one really knows for sure. You could almost flip a coin over it in one sense. I personally lead towards Absalom, and so that's kind of the direction I've taken in this message here. But if you prefer Saul, that's cool. No big deal. We're square. I'm not going to not going to, you know, rail you for that or anything like that. But what I really want you to pay attention to is what is described about them at the beginning of verse 10, okay? This is very important. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. This is the trickiest part of the psalm, so I need you to pay extra special attention, okay? So if you're napping, it's time to wake up, right? Look at the words. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. Many of you have a New American Standard Bible, probably a Legacy Standard Bible in your lap. That's great. Um, And if that's the case, and your version has notes in the margins, I don't know if you have notes in the margins or not, um, you'll probably see a number one located in front of the first word they of that verse. A number one, a brief little number one. If you see that there, go ahead and trace that. Find the corresponding number one in your notes, and you'll notice what it says there. It says that the text should literally read, they will pour him out. They will pour him out. Now, if you have like an NKJV, it will read something similar in its notes, by the way. So that's cool. Now, what this means is that the original Hebrew text, the the text that David actually wrote this psalm in, reads, they will pour him out. Not, it does not read, they will be delivered over. Okay? Okay. But for one reason or another, the translators decided to translate it, they will be delivered over, okay? So does that make sense? Are you tracking so far with what's going on here? That's what's going on, all right? So sorry for the, the technical. I'll, we're, we'll, I'll tell you why this is important in just a little bit, okay? So just keep tracking. Now, this is a big difference. This is a big difference. Your translation says they will be delivered over, while the original Hebrew that David wrote it in says they will pour him out. And the big difference is not when your translation replaces the words poured out with the words delivered over, okay? So don't make that um, uh, assumption there because those words basically mean the same thing. To pour out means to deliver over. It's just pour out is just an artistic way of saying deliver over, okay? That's not the big difference. The big difference that is concerning here is, is in who's being delivered over. Who's actually being delivered over? Notice how the text went from David's enemies being delivered over to David's enemies delivering someone else over. You see that there? They will be delivered over versus they will deliver him over. Normally, I would not make a big deal about a footnote uh, like this in your Bible, but this one I must. And if you're like, well, what's the big deal about this? Who cares which one it is, right? Uh, The big deal is we're trying to figure out who's dying. That's the big deal. I mean, how would you like it if the fate of your life was on a footnote, right? I think footnotes would all of a sudden become the most important thing in your life at that moment, right? Um, Either David's enemies are about to die or they're about to make someone else die. That's about as big as a difference as you're going to get. So the truth be told here, not only are people's lives hanging in the balance, Um, but the meaning of the psalm itself hangs on this decision as well. So which one is it? Are David's enemies dying, as your translation reads it, or are they killing someone else instead, as the footnote in original Hebrew has it? The only way to find out for sure is to figure out how this uh, phrase is used across other parts of the Hebrew Old Testament. 
How does, this phrase actually appears in other parts of Scripture. How is it used? And when you do that, you will find out that 100% of the time, 100% of the time, the words always mean someone is delivering someone else over to the power of the sword. Someone is delivering someone else over to the power of the sword. Not that someone is being delivered over. Not that that individual himself is being delivered over. So really, which one is the text really should be translated as? Whatever's in the footnote. Whatever's in the footnote. That is actually what the text is saying. And if you need cross-references for that, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 21, Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5 are good examples of that. Bottom line, if you got nothing else from that ridiculous hike through Hebrew grammar pass, um, just know this. Your Bible translation at the beginning of verse 10 should read this way. They will deliver him over to the power of the sword. The text actually says that David's enemies will deliver someone over to be executed. Now, I belabor all this because this presents us an important question that we need to answer. Who is the him? Who is the him? Who are David's enemies going to kill? Believe it or not, the answer to this question actually makes or breaks this psalm. It makes or breaks this psalm. Who is this guy? Someone might say, well, maybe it's David. After all, in verse 9, it says they are seeking to destroy his life. Good point. What's the problem, though? We know from biblical history that David doesn't die at their hands. We know that the day of his death is not the hands of any enemies. He dies in old age. And wouldn't it just be easier for, and more natural for David to say, they will deliver me over to the power of the sword? I mean, he's been using the first person this whole time, so... This has to be somebody else. But the fact is, there's no one else left in the psalm up to this point to put forward. There's David's enemies. We just ruled them out. There's David. We just ruled him out. That just leaves one option left. There's one more person we haven't looked at yet because he hasn't made an appearance yet. But he does in verse 11. That's the king. The king. The king will be glad in God. Who's the king? Who's the king? Oh, but I thought the king referred to David, you say. Yeah, I guess that could be true in theory. Except when you look at every time David mentions a king in his Psalms, it almost really never refers to himself. It actually, 100% of the time, refers to God. God. So is that, is that it? Is God this mystery man? That doesn't make any sense. How could David's enemies kill God? Unless, unless of course what? We're not talking about God spiritually, but Christ bodily. And now you have your answer. What is David doing in these final verses? As cryptic and confusing as it may appear uh, on the surface to us, David is offering a veiled look at a time in his distant future when a king similar to himself faces a situation similar to his own. I mean, the Messiah will even be driven into the wilderness just like his predecessor David for crying out loud, right? But Jesus takes his role as king a step further than David. In verse 9, David's enemies were seeking to destroy his life but never did. However, in verse 10, the Messiah's enemies will try to hand him over to be crucified, and they will what? Succeed. They will succeed. Verse 10, then, wouldn't you know it, is an Easter egg of the cross. It is an Easter egg of the cross. Imagine that. Oh, but it gets better. Because look at verse 11. But the king will be glad in God. How can the king be executed and then one verse later be glad again? That doesn't make any sense. Unless, unless of course what? He rises from the dead. So verse 11 then is an Easter egg of the what? The resurrection. That's why the psalm ends on such a victorious note here. It says, everyone who swears by him will boast. 
Why can everyone swear, who swears by the king boast? Because if he rises from the dead, what does that imply? They will rise from the dead too. Do you remember how earlier in the sermon I said the phrase in verse 3, your loving kindness is better than life? It was like eons ago. That that was what brought David so much satisfaction. Your loving kindness is better than life. But that David didn't define what that meant. He just kind of left us in the dark. Well, now he finally defines it. What does it mean that God's loving kindness is better than life? It means that God's loving kindness doesn't just work out good in this life, but that it is so strong, so powerful, so glorious that it, that it even reaches beyond this life. It reaches beyond the grave itself to raise you from the dead. This is the powerful story David was itching to see in the tabernacle. This is the glorious message he wanted to experience. The tabernacle and all its ritual services uh, wasn't some kind of legalistic checklist that people needed to just complete or something like that. Don't think about it that way. It was telling the powerful story, the glorious message of the gospel that God one day will provide a sacrifice and a substitute sufficient enough to even raise you from the dead. That's a powerful story. That's a glorious message. That's what was satisfying David. And so that's why God is so satisfying. Who else can do that? Who else does that? No matter what wilderness you're facing, you can always have the utmost confidence in joy in the Lord because even if the wilderness gets so bad that it kills you, just as it killed our Lord, you will rise from the dead because he did so too for you, for you. This is the ultimate trump card. It's the greatest vindication over David's enemies. Although God's people are always the ones driven into the wilderness all their lives, facing persecution, suffering, and difficulty from every angle, from all their enemies, all their foes, and their foes are taunting them and mocking them and saying, look at you, you're nothing, your God is nothing. Well, we can just say right back, how about we're gonna rise from the dead, right? You can't can't stop that. And that is the ultimate trump card for every believer, They can kill us, but we will rise from the dead because we belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. And his victory is so complete because he died for us and he rose for us. We trust in that. God is all satisfying because he's all supporting. God is all supporting because he's all saving. Therefore, it is unmistakable, God is all you need. He is all you need. Listen, when you're in the middle of the wilderness and you feel there's nowhere to go, nowhere to turn, this is where you go. This is where you go. God sends you into the wilderness to show you just how great and how exhaustive and just how satisfying his salvation is through his son. It's one thing to be satisfied by God. It's another thing to be supported by God, but it's a whole different ballgame to then be saved by God, to have your sins forgiven, to be wiped away, and to be then in a right relationship with the creator of the universe. Nothing beats that. And then to be raised from the dead, to be given eternal life, nothing is in comparison to that. When you dig your way down into this gold mine, you will learn what it really means that God is all you need. In the middle of the wilderness, run to the gospel and you will find that God is all you need. But I understand that there may be some of you here this morning who have never run to the gospel in your life. Maybe you think you have run to the gospel, but you really haven't trusted in Christ alone. That it is his death, it is his resurrection, that is that which is meritorious for your salvation. It's not your good works. It's not your efforts. It's not your sacrifices. It's not your kindness. It's not any of these different things. It's Christ. What did David hinge his hope on by the end of Psalm 63? That they would deliver him over and then he would be glad in God. That's how we boast. We boast in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I encourage you, if you have not surrendered your heart to the Lord, it's not too late. Today is the day. Bow and repent before the Lord. Give up your own fleeting attempts at escaping your wilderness on your own. Confess your inability. Admit you're a sinner. And trust in Christ alone to be your one and only Savior. And you will find God to be all-saving. And if he's all-saving, then you'll find him to be all-supporting. And if he's all-supporting, you will find him to be all-satisfying. You'll see that he's really all you ever need. Shall we pray to him? Father, we thank you so much that the gospel has given us so much hope that Jesus Christ really has died on the cross and he rose from the dead, paying the debt that we owe and taking upon himself the judgment of God that we deserve so that we could be forgiven and cleansed and have a right relationship with you. That is the best. And because of that salvation, we know that we will always be supported in this life. Even through the trials and difficulties that you assign us, you are carrying us through to the very end. And because of all that, O oh God, we can say with all of our hearts, God, you are my God. I will search earnestly for you. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh yearns for you, even though I might be in this dry and weary land. Help us, O oh God, to ascend in our hearts, to worship you with all of our hearts, to trust in you with every fiber of our being and lead us, O oh God, in your grace. As one of the Psalms concludes, shepherd your people Israel, so shepherd us, O oh God, and carry your people forever. And it's to that end we do pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.